When Ed Markey was challenged by Joe Kennedy in last year's Democratic primary, he got a big boost that almost nobody had seen coming. Intense support from young political activists, in some cases too young to vote, whose efforts helped Markey win big in a race he was originally expected to lose. Toward the end of that campaign, Markey gave those young supporters a starring role in his Green New Deal Maker ad, praising them for putting pressure on the political establishment. We asked what we could do for our country. We went out. We did it. With all due respect, it's time to start asking what your country can do for you. But now, relations between the senator and the so-called Markyverse have cooled a bit, with many of his youthful backers calling him out publicly for his stance on Israel and Palestine. It's a case study in the rising power of young activists here in Massachusetts and how they see their relationship with the politicians they help elect. In a new New York Times story, an army of 16-year-olds takes on the Democrats. Pulitzer winner Ellen Berry digs into that topic. I'm joined now by Ellen Berry and two members of the army in question. Lillian Gibson, who worked to elect Markey and is now focused on Boston's mayoral race, is the head of Youth for Michelle Wu. And Calla Walsh, who's part of the ongoing push to pressure Markey on the Middle East. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Uh, Ellen, let me start with you. Having spent some time on this topic, what are the biggest ways you see that people like Lillian and Calla are challenging basic assumptions about the way politics is supposed to work? Well, I mean, I think one big way is challenging our sort of historic expectations on turnout. Um, I, I think if you begin to look at how turnout, especially for primary elections, where it, you know, there's always been traditionally a pretty low turnout. Um, the pattern here in Massachusetts is like a hockey stick, um, where in 2016, you had something like a 2% turnout of 18 to 24 year olds. And then in the last, in last year, you had, I think, almost 20%. So it's an extraordinary change in who's voting. So I would say that's the biggest one. Um, I think the second is that there is an ability of the grassroots to kind of shape a media narrative about the race and, and the candidates, which hasn't existed before. Uh, Lillian, what do you having, by the way, I should ask, how long have you led Youth for Woo, the group that you're leading? Um, since September, okay. so bef right before Michelle announced her um, run. Okay, so you've been working with the campaign for quite a while now. From your experience, what do you see you and the young people that you work with in that group or subgroup offering the Wu campaign that they might not have gotten otherwise? Yeah, I think it's great to see increased youth engagement and just more interest in Michelle's campaign. I think that young people are providing unique ways to share information about her policy. Like we've had some policy reading groups to help um, educate both youth, you know, in high school to college to even older than that, learn more about her different policy plans. And we've also just been able to uh, have a different section of the campaign and gain, and gain interest from a different area that the campaign may, may not have been able to. Uh, what's a typical week? for you working with the Wu campaign. I'm wondering about the, the sort of stuff that you do on a typical week, if there is a typical week, but also how many hours you end up investing. Yeah, so I attend two meetings, one with the campaign and then one with everyone else on the leadership team with Youth for Wu's. That's probably two hours. Then depending on events we have, that can increase to six or plus hours a week. And I also work heavily with making graphics. Um, so that's a focus that I you know, give to Youth for Woo, so I spend time on that as well. Are you, um, I, when I think of the Woo campaign logo, and I don't want to get it wrong, and I probably will get it wrong, I think of, of sort of a, 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 a quickly scrawled, scrawl makes it sound like it doesn't look good, and it does, but Woo written with an exclamation point that conveys energy. Are you in any way connected to that logo? No, I am not. But okay. I will say one thing that the campaign, since they launched, um, they've had a grassroots toolkit with all the different logos and all they given access to their volunteers to really take advantage of that to make content. So that's been great to see with the logo. Got it. And one final question for you, and then I'll turn to Kala. What was it that made you decide that the Woo campaign was the one you wanted to work with? 
Yeah, so I attended a, a launch of Michelle's Green New Deal back in August and seeing her even before she ran wanting to really take charge and change, you know, what city government does. That's originally, you know, interested me. And then seeing her center communities that are most impacted by climate at her launch event really meant a lot to me living in Dorchester and seeing some inequalities around the urban tree canopy and, and the urban heat island effect. So that was what originally um, attracted her to me and then also uh, her work against the BPDA was what really um, her, her calling the institution out was that the Boston um, plan. Might. Sorry, the Boston Planning and Development Agency. Just want to make sure for viewers who might not know it. Thank you, um, Kala. Let me ask you the same question. When you became as deeply involved with Markey's campaign last year as you did, what was it that made you sign on with him rather than with his opponent or rather than sitting out the race? Yeah, thanks for the question, Adam. So I actually got involved with politics in the summer of 2019, and that was through climate organizing. So I was organizing for the Boston Climate Strike, which was in September of 2019, you know, at least 20,000 people turned out. And um, Senator Markey did not just show up to take a picture, but he actually was behind, you know, the biggest policy where we were pushing the Green New Deal, um, similar to what Lillian said about how Michelle is pushing a Green New Deal on the citywide level. Um, and after, uh, you know, COVID began, I had just recently gotten off the Warren presidential campaign. A lot of my friends had just also gotten off the Warren presidential campaign or the Bernie campaign. And we were really looking, you know, where we could direct our energy and um, organize for another amazing progressive candidate, specifically in Massachusetts. And what better candidate than Ed Markey, we thought, who was being challenged by, you know, a wealthy political dynasty who was a champion of so many issues we cared about, the Green New Deal, Medicare for All, which we sort of felt like we'd lost hope for um, at the presidential level, but could still really fight for in our own state. Let me ask you about the shift that has occurred with you and many other uh, younger Markey supporters. I'm curious about when you guys unveiled the open letter that, that you sent or released calling out his position on Israel and Palestine. Did you try approaching the uh, campaign or Markey's office behind the scenes to let him know about your frustration? Or did you decide, you know, what he said just doesn't work for us and we are gonna, um, we're gonna let people know that publicly right now? Yeah, so we had actually been pressuring the office um, publicly, mainly through social media, since that's, you know, our most natural form of communication, I guess, with the office and the staff and the senator himself uh, before the statement was even released. And um, I guess we were really disappointed that after so many days of us um, pressuring him to just say something, he released something that to us was very disappointing, that did not place enough blame on Israel for instigating the violence in Gaza. And uh, we decided a letter would be a really great approach because we, you know, are not as well connected behind the scenes as so many, you know, pro-Israel lobbyist groups are. We don't have the money. We don't have lobbyists. We are mainly a group of young people, of organizers, um, just on social media, working on the ground to organize. And so we thought a letter would be a great way to increase pressure because we could just get so many people who had only got involved with the campaign because it was so accessible to them um, to sign on. So we were able to get over a thousand signatures as of today, um, including politicians, including uh, former campaign staff, former Senate staff, volunteers, campaign fellows, and organizations like the Sunrise Movement who played um, integral roles in his reelection. And before I go back to, to Ellen for a second, how likely do you think it is that you are in fact gonna be able to shift his stance on Israel and Palestine? You know, I'm not really sure, but um, I am optimistic. You know, I've been thinking a lot back to Senator Markey's victory speech from September 1st. And uh, one, one word he, or one phrase he kept using was justice was on the ballot on September 1st. And to me, this feels like such a clear issue of um, justice and injustice. Um, it's to me a clear issue of human rights abuses, apartheid, ethnic cleansing. And for um, someone who talks so much about justice, I feel like it should be really clear to the Senator and his office. And I hope that he is able to realize that soon. Ellen Barry, you quoted a few seasoned political professionals in your piece um, talking admiringly about Lillian and Kala and their cohort. You also alluded to conversations that you'd had with other people who are part of the political establishment, consultants, that sort of thing, who didn't want to go on the record um, saying anything that might be perceived as negative, in part, if I re read it correctly, because they were afraid of what the consequences might be. They were afraid that they would have to tangle on Twitter and that it might not go in their favor. 
What did the people who might have been skeptical or critical, what kind of stuff did they, what kind of points did they raise on background with you? So it should be said that political strategists are not super enthusiastic about being on the record to begin with about anything. Yep. Um, but but sure, I had a number of conversations with people um, who who have represented or will represent candidates that are in the progressive world. Um, and I think there's definitely a fear that your candidate could be the next Joe Kennedy, that you could find that someone else has framed the sort of frame the narrative around the around the race and there's not much you can do about it. Um, so in the Marky Kennedy race, you still hear a lot of people saying, look, we've known Marky for 44 years. He's been around for a long time and he's not the sort of left icon that he came out as, that there was a kind of selective focus on parts of his record that ignored other parts of his record, like his foreign policy um, history. So, so that's one that there's an oversimplification and sometimes distortion of the records. Um, so the other is that, you know, it's it's the left kind of going after its own side, that a lot of times the targets of the Markyverse are people who could could be called progressives or they're, you know. And I think the fear is that it's um, kind of taking down people who are part of the future of your party. Let me ask you both, Lillian and Kala, uh, in the description that, that Ellen just gave, there's clearly, I, I would say, a lot of admiration, some of it grudging, for the amount of power that you guys now wield in the democratic landscape. Do you have any comment or response to some of the um, the concerns that some of Ellen's sources raised with her not on the record? Well, something that they criticized us for was that this was some sort of coordinated attack operation to push the Democratic Party to the left. And I thought that was really funny since they thought that was an insult to us, but that is basically how we describe what we're doing. That is the ultimate goal, to push the Democratic Party to the left. So I guess when you talk about whether we're attacking people on our own side, I guess in some ways we don't necessarily view those people as on our side because we do fundamentally disagree with them on a lot of different issues and on a lot of different issues they're more similar to Republicans than we are to them. Lillian, I'd love to get your take on this. Do you feel like um, do you feel like any of the concerns that Ellen sources mentioned that she just described have any merit or not so much? Hmm, I would say that I think that young people have always been calling out, you know, people, institutions that they they disagree with, and I think that um, the the Markyverse just had strength this this time, were able to, and I continue to, you know, call out people who we don't agree with. But I think that I think that um, it shouldn't be a surprise that with social media and 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 with you know the, the Twitter landscape that people could energize a whole group of people and uh, make a change. So I think that. It's a positive thing, you know. I think people view it in very many different ways, but I think that young people organizing and for many different issues, not just for their candidate at that one time, is really important. We should be making sure to hold people accountable. Let me throw out one more question for Lillian and Kala, in whatever order you want. I'd love to get your take on this. Um, if there are politicians who might be watching this interview who are thinking, "Yeah, I'd love to tap into that kind of energy somehow," I think that you know they'd probably respond well to a lot of the things I bring to the table. What sort of candidates would you say that you and your peers are are looking for right now and eager to work with? Yeah, I think people that center equity, that's really important to me personally. Um, I think that it's important to, for candidates to be open to hearing and supporting young people within campaigns. I think that you can't just replicate what happened with the Markyverse, but I think if you really invest in listening to young people and valuing their time and energy that you can deliver. And I think that it's clear if you, you know, value, you know, progressive policies and are willing to, you know, take in, in community feedback and really try to you know, have a platform that is inclusive and that sort of pushes against the mold. I think that that, that, that definitely attracts young people and could um, be somewhat similar to what happened this summer. Kella, you get the last word. Anything else? I absolutely agree with Lillian. Uh, this is a question I got a lot after the September 1st primary, and 
The funny thing is often this question would come from moderate politicians. So my response would be, none of these strategies are gonna work if you don't already have the policy platform, if you're not already fighting for young people with your values. Um, so I will say that I think any progressive, you know, youth oriented strategy only works if you want to have a progressive campaign platform, but also if you are actually doing progressive campaigning. So sure, you could say I support the Green New Deal, but if you're not, you know, actively elevating youth voices on your campaign, if you're not paying your interns and fellows, if you're not calling um, young voters and trying to expand the electorate, then your values don't really mean anything. All right. Kella Walsh, Lillian Gibson and Ellen Berry. Thank you all for being here to talk about this.